Hello, my name is Jane Pierce and I'm the curator of the South George Museum. I've been working for many years in museums now, but most of my experience is from working in museums in London and the UK. So I'm used to commuting from home every day and spending most of my time on the museum site. Working for a remote museum such as South Georgia Museum um, has been completely different. How do we care for the collections when we're working remotely? So what happens for five or six months of the year when there's nobody there? And what problems does this present? I think I spent my first season in South Georgia this summer and today I want to give you um, a bit of an insight into my experiences firsthand, how I felt it went and what I learned from working not only in a new museum but a new completely new environment in um, a very remote environment. I also want to talk to you a little bit about what curators do and what I have to think about when looking after a collection. So, this is the museum. As you can see, it's when we first arrived, it was thick with snow, blue sky. South Georgia is very remote. The nearest neighbour is the Falklands, over 800 miles away. You can't fly to South Georgia, there's no airstrip. So the journey takes a 18 hour flight from the UK to the Falklands, followed by a five, sea, five day sea journey um, to get there. So we left in early October and arrived to thick snow, as you can see from the photograph. The museum is the building on the left and on the right there's a smaller building and that was actually our accommodation. So you can see my daily commute was reduced to probably around 45 seconds. So that was kind of a treat, but very, very different from what I've experienced before. The other significant difference is the climate. The visitor season is limited to November to March every year and within that time scale it can go from a lovely summery feeling of day to again snow, awful weather, so it's very very changeable. South Georgia is a sub-Antarctic island. It lies within the polar front so it can get very cold. The climate is maritime and the average winter temperature can drop to mostly about five degrees, it can go, go as low as minus 10. And the average summer temperature typically is around eight to 10 degrees, but obviously it can go a little bit warmer. So although there is not significant changes, it does feel quite different from winter to summer. Again, this is just another photograph to show you the difference. On the top right is the museum team in all of their summer plumage. We just gathered around um, Ernest Shackleton's grave there in midsummer, um, toasting the boss on what was our Christmas day on the 27th of December. And you can see exactly the same view that was taken on the 22nd of July this year um, in midwinter. So lots of snow on the ground. So the museum is located in an old whaling station in Griffithen. And the building was once the original manager's museum and um, the centre of administration in the whaling station. The image you can see here was taken in 1906. That actual building was built in Norway and shipped down to South Georgia and erected there on that site in 1906. This building unfortunately was um, destroyed in a fire. So the building was rebuilt in 1914 and is the same as the building you saw in the previous slide. Whaling ceased in South Georgia in 1964 and so the building that the museum lives in now was dormant for over 20 years before being opened in 1992 to the public. The rooms are arranged around a central entrance and they reflect all aspects of South Georgia um, including whaling, social history, expedition exploration, natural history, and we even have information on military and maritime. So displays um, show different parts of the collection from whale barnacles to albatross eggs to beer bottles um, 
and we also have um, a display of maritime material and um, you can see a replica of the James Caird there. This is a replica of a whaler's bunk room taken from one of the actual original buildings um, it's just a recreation of what we think a room would have looked like based on materials that have been found and salvaged from the area. So the curator, my job. My job is very different. Um, most curators' um, roles vary quite significant, significantly depending on the size of the museum, the size of the collection um, and the size of the organisation. In small museums, such as the South Georgia Museum, the curator has to multitask. So here you can see um, my work encompasses all aspects of the collections care, such as cleaning and putting up shelves, um, but also including things like exhibitions work. So installing them and writing them, but also I can actually spend quite a lot of time at my desk um, working with documentation and writing labels for displays. But one of the main parts of my role is to care for the collections and manage the collections. You can see here again, we're back dusting. Collections care is central to the work of any museum. The collections are obviously the most important resource for a museum. They make the museums unique and without them, it wouldn't exist. So caring for the collection um, makes them available to be viewed and displayed and accessible to the public and to educate and inspire. So we're trying to put the objects out on display to educate and inspire, but also to try and maintain them for future generations. So we have to put the objects first, otherwise the museum would cease to exist. Even when the museum is close to the public, it's important that this care of the collection is continued so that we can safeguard everything, keep it um, secure and clean and safe so that when we do open to the public again, it's safe and things return to normal. So with that in mind, what keeps a curator awake at night? <laughs> What do I worry about when it comes to collections care? As I was saying, our heritage um, is represented by a vast array of cultural material from you know, national icons to day-to-day -day social uh, materials such as you know, newspapers and our mugs we drink our tea out of. All of these things are important and tell a story um, about our history, our community, our families, our cultural heritage. And so we have to protect all these objects to be able to tell all those stories and prolong the life of our cultural heritage. So a big part of my role is to know the enemy. <laughs> and this, the enemy, if you like, are what we call agents of deterioration. So there are 10 things that we have to keep checks on to look after our objects and our collections. One of the big ones is physical forces. Physical forces are things such as impact, shock and vibration um, often caused when we move an object, whether that's from storage to display or for research or for a loan where we have to ship it to another museum. Um, these are all things that we can prevent and make an object safe by keeping it in proper storage, packed up properly, or if it's on display, it's properly supported, um, so that we can kind of minimise that physical risk, if you like. So that's normal for any museum, but in South Georgia, what I discovered was that the wildlife provide a whole extra dimension that I've never experienced before. <laughs> um, locals, disrupting things, the outdoor um, objects, as you can see here, this um, small young elephant seal um, suddenly decided to take a nap against one of the old um, ship masts. The wildlife is very um, 
holds no bounds um, and is quite happily will come right up to the doorstep of the museum and they go wherever they like, which is quite interesting and something I've never experienced before. For example, this is two of the museum team and here they are giving um, an old ship propeller um, a look of paint. You can see the mast in the background where the seal was using as a pillow just in the background. So here they are hard at work giving the propeller a new look of paint and yet within hours some more seals have decided to use the propeller as a little rest and a windbreak. So there's, there's no let up for those objects, they're constantly being physically manoeuvred by the uh, wildlife. Although they don't present an immediate danger, um, it is an extra factor that I'd never considered before. This year we also had um, a young fur seal pup come into the museum when we weren't looking when our backs were turned and again he was quite happily exploring the museum until one of the museum team discovered him um, in, in a corner of a room. So again, it's another aspect I've never realised before. Um, another item that is quite, um, can be quite a significant problem for bigger museums um, is the issue of object loss due to um, theft or vandalism and um, luckily in South Georgia we don't have such a significant security risk. We do have some penguins that obviously get quite interested in the objects but actually the risk of security is not such a major problem we have. Another major risk to museums and to any building, in fact, is the risk of fire and water damage. Again, South Georgia, it's, an old, it's a single storey building. It's very um, self-contained and it's very safe, but fire and water damage is always the risk. We work with the government and the British Antarctic Survey staff to look at the uh, fire risks and the water damage risks and there are measures in place to constantly check and maintain all of those um, systems but obviously if there was to be a fire no one is coming to put out that fire apart from the local community so there is a lot of training involved with all of the staff and everyone on the island probably around 20 people understand the risks and are all trained so that it should any the worst happen that we're all ready to um, to deal with the problem but as I say the um, lots of systems are put in place to minimize that threat again in most museums around the world um, they're located in urban environments and that often comes with a level of pollution and lots of population and with that brings pollutants and pests such as um, bugs and things like clothes moss and so one of the really interesting uh, factors of the South Georgia Museum is that the atmosphere is very clean and um, it's not urban and there's not that many people, um, no population, and the visitors are, numbers are actually quite low. When I arrived in South Georgia after the museum had been shut for six months, I was quite astounded by the minimal dust that was around the museum and the displays. So actually, although they are issues, it's very, very minimal. And so one of the good things about it being in a remote environment is these two two issues are very small. Again, another problem, um, which is actually um, easy to prevent, is pollution from light. Um, all objects um, can be affected by light. And one of the quick wins is to put blinds up turn lights off at the end of the day and trying to reduce the exposure of objects to light. Um, in this photo you can see on a lovely beautiful sunny day 
the sunlight is beaming through and hitting all the objects on display. Again, this can be reduced by fitting blinds and again at the end of the day making sure that everything is shut down and dark. This is one of our very special specimens, so a very large wandering albatross and feathers and lots of other organic matter do suffer greatly from uh, light exposure. So again, this specimen is kept safe by being put behind blinds so that on a day-to-day -day basis it's kept in the dark and so these beautiful feathers that you can see here um, don't um, go through decay. Two of the most crucial environmental parameters that a curator has to worry about are the temperature and relative humidity. We are all used to um, thinking about temperature, you know, it's especially being British, it's something we talk about all the time and discuss the weather all the time. And we're less interested in generally in humidity. But temperature and humidity are very closely intertwined and have a very powerful impact on objects and can drastically um, increase their deterioration. So we have to be very careful about temperature and humidity. And it's probably the two things that a curator worries about the most. The good news in South Georgia is that the temperatures are low, generally overall, and it's believed that for every five degrees drop in temperature, the uh, deterioration of an object or of material can be halved. So the fact that most of the year, the temperatures in South Georgia are around zero to five degrees is just really great. It's, it's like having everything in deep, cool storage. And apart from a few significant materials, such as maybe plastics becoming brittle, this is actually a really good thing. So everyone understands about temperature, um, but what is relative humidity? If, if an environment is dry or very damp, um, you can generally feel it with your skin. Um, if you feel dry, you can feel a bit itchy and your skin feels dry. Um, and if it's very hot and humid, you feel clammy. But the feeling these extremes is not good enough to actually understand what's really happening. So for a collection to really understand the changes and what effects it's having on the collection, we really need to monitor the environment and take strict measurements. So what can happen if the relative humidity is not brilliant? So if we have too high humidity, we can get corrosion in metals and we can also get mold growing on some substrates. If the humidity is too low, um, some organic materials can shrink and um, crack and split um, as they release moisture back into the air. So this is um, an issue that we don't really want to do. So we're trying to create a very stable relative humidity. So the question is, what is relative humidity? That is the, the, the big question. So this is the uh, science bit. So have to listen carefully now to, um, to try and hopefully I can explain it. Um, relative humidity is the amount of water vapor in a fixed volume of air relative the, to the amount of water that could be held in the air at a given temperature. So it's expressed as a percentage. So for example, in this slide, you can see that in the middle, um, at 20 degrees C, you can see the amount of water vapor, which is blue, and the percentage of air that uh, could contain water vapor. Um, so therefore it gives us a relative humidity of 55%. If we increase the temperature to 30 degrees, then we increase the potential water vapor, vapor capacity. 
so that's the yellow again. So you can see that although the water vapour has stayed the same, the capacity of that air to take more water is much bigger. So therefore, we can see a reduction in the relative humidity, which is 28%. Again, if we decrease, decrease the temperature down to 10 degrees, the, um, we increase the relative humidity and the potential for the air to hold more water is reduced. The temperature which results in a 100% relative humidity is known as, as a saturation point, or, or we can actually call it the dew point. And the dew point is when we would see condensation, let's say on a window or on a surface. And in the museum, in terms of objects um, and looking after the collections, we really want to avoid hitting that dew point and get, getting condensation on the objects or on any, any surface. As soon as we start getting water vapour on objects, that's when we start seeing problems. So how do we measure temperature and relative humidity? Um, a stable environment is the single greatest asset um, when caring for a collection. And it's really important that we take these measurements and try and get an understanding of what's happening in the building. Environmental monitoring is a term we give to this, this activity. And it's the regular measurement of not only temperature and relative humidity, but also light. And trying to get a picture of, of what's going on to try and prevent issues and creating um, a sustainable environment and building, if you like. We have a variety of tools that we use. On the left in this image, you can see um, what we call a digital uh, thermohydrograph. And it gives us on the spot readings. So it, this can only tell us what's happening at that moment that the reading is taken. On the right, we have something called a data logger. And that regularly takes data of temperature and relative humidity let's say every 20 minutes of every day um, until it's full of data and then you can download it and gather data from quite a big period of time. These are really useful for data analysis and allow us to collect data even when um, we're not present. So from a remote point of view, um, the museum is closed for winter, but we're actually still collecting data um, and that's really, really useful to see what's happening in the museum while we're not there. Just to give you a little example of where we've got to, uh, we started this season with um, some data loggers. So we've only just started to build a picture of what's happening in the museum while we're not there. And this is a case that we're currently monitoring. It's our natural history case and it's full of um, really um, wonderful taxidermy, skeletal matter, and we've even got um, a wet specimen there too. This room, and obviously the whole building is unheated. This case is not sealed either, so it's very exposed and mimics actually what's happening on the outside. Just to give you an idea then of what's occurring, and what we're starting to see with this data that we're collecting. This is the data from this winter, actually. So you can see it's from March when we left to around um, end of August. So pretty much most of the winter. And what you can see here is the green line represents the humidity and the blue line represents the temperature. And as we expect, as the temperature is dropping, it goes down to about minus four there. The humidity is slowly rising. And although you can see lots of wobbles, they're actually, wobbles are occurring over a day or two. And so it's quite low wobbles. And actually, um, the good news is that um, it's quite slow changes. It's not fluctuating wildly. And if you can see the black line at the bottom, that's the dew point. That's the point where the water vapor 
um, in the air would be 100% saturated and we'd start to get condensation problems. And we're not reaching that. So it's good news. So it is cold. It is quite humid, but that's that's an artifact of being with cold temperatures. And we're not hitting the dew point. So it's it's not such a bleak picture as I would expect. And we're quite happy with that. In uh, opposite to that, we've got some news which is not great. So in the summer, when we actually first got these data loggers, we were seeing quite wildly fluctuating temperatures and humidity. So you can see on that previous one, we had some wobbles over days, but these are huge wobbles. So the temperature is moving from eight degrees up to 16 degrees in the space of a day. So what's happening here? Um, something that I wouldn't expect such dramatic changes um, and we think this issue is due to visitors. So when we have nice empty room, the temperatures and humidity are kind of corresponding to the outside. And when we get visitors coming in, we get these sudden rises in temperature with lots of bodies in the space. And therefore the humidity um, is dropping as the temperature is rising, as we would expect. But what's not great is seeing such a quick change and it's these quick changes and these big fluctuations that are potentially a headache um, for us. So what we don't understand is how much that change is having an impact on the objects. So when visitors come in, if it's raining, they've got wet coats on, wet shoes on, they're breathing, uh, they're raising the temperature in the gallery, it's getting a bit hot and humid. How much of a problem is this to our objects? Well, we don't have the answers to that yet, um, but that's something that over the next few years we want to look at. So there's lots of work for the future. This is just the beginning. It's my first year and hopefully when I can go back to the museum again, we can keep looking at these issues that potentially have effect on the collection's care. While we're over in the UK, we're still collecting that data, which is really good news, so we can start to get a picture of, of what's going on. In such an extreme environment, um, trying to identify what's causing deterioration in objects is quite difficult. And so collecting all the, this data um, helps us diagnose those problems. And it's not an ideal world, so we can't recreate the perfect environments. It would be unsustainable, it would cost money, um, it would cost energy, and that's not what we want to do. What we're aiming for is to try and reach a point of balance where the objects are in harmony with the building, the buildings in harmony with the environment, without us having um, to apply any direct intervention or any um, major intervention such as trying to heat the whole building which doesn't seem right in such a sensitive environment as South Georgia. A lot of the objects have now become acclimatized to that extreme environment and so are stable in a very um, delicate way. By adding lots of visitors are we adding to the problem? Is there anything we can do to try and balance that problem? We want people to come to the museum. Obviously, visitors are very important to the museum. If there weren't visitors, then what's the reason for the museum to exist? So it's trying to think about how we can create that balance. So I'm hoping with a combined approach um, and a long-term view of the museum and environment within the building, um, if we can establish that, keep monitoring, then hopefully that data collection over the next two or three years, we can create some simple cost effective solutions to looking after that collection. Um, so that's my last slide. And I just want to say thank you for listening. I hope some of it makes sense. And hopefully I'll speak to you again in another year and let you know how we're getting on. Hello everyone. So as uh, our curator Jane Pierce didn't get an opportunity to talk to you live on the 8th of October, uh, we've decided to give you a little bonus uh, Q&A session with her. 
and asking the questions today will be myself, Alison Neal, Chief Executive of the Trust, and Jane Bevan, who is our newest trustee. So uh, over to Jane for the first question. Okay, well, I want to start by asking you, Jane, um, You've obviously got a wide experience of working in museums in the UK sector, and yet now you find yourself in, in South Georgia, the South Georgia Museum. And I wondered sort of what you feel you're going to bring particularly to that, that, that role. Um. Um, so the South Georgia Museum is um, quite different from where I've worked before. I've worked um, with collections as small as 200 objects to 2 million objects. And I've worked in all aspects of museum life from dusting display cabinets to managing a team of curate, curators and conservators. So I've, I feel like I've seen every angle of how a museum functions. And I think that's really helpful to understand how all of those aspects come together to make a museum work and to open up to visitors. Um, one of the fundamental points of a museum is having objects and preserving objects. And the objects are core to a museum and all of those stories. And visitors, when they come to a museum, uh, objects really help engage and make a connection to the visitors to those stories without objects you know a museum is all is, is nothing and so one of my skills I think is looking forward to the future so South Georgia Museum is 30 years old now it was opened in 1992 and if we want to make sure the museum stays open for another 30 years another 50 years we have to really look after the collections and really think about how we preserve the objects and the stories for the future and to maintain that legacy and look forward. Um, and I hope my experience and looking at all of those aspects of museum work can really help tell that story. Mm. Great. So as a museum professional, what would you say are the unique selling points of the South Georgia Museum? So the South Georgia Museum is quite wonderful and there can't be many museums like it on the planet. And one of its super, super strengths, I think, if you're visiting the museum in South Georgia, is that you're able to make a real connection with what's happening outside the museum and what the museum is trying to say. To get to the museum in Ripwickham, you have to walk through the heritage site of the whaling station. You have to pick your way through the wildlife to get to the front door and you know you're right there in it the wildlife the weather the 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 atmosphere as soon as you walk into the museum and look at the displays you have an instant connection to those displays because you can see it happening outside the window of the museum and that's a, a really um, significant strength of the museum and um, in terms of people who are unable to visit South Georgia um, one of its strengths is that connection between human intervention and nature, and that's really, really um, significant today, and it's a really important subject area, and I think South Georgia Museum has a really um, important role in telling that story, um, and I think it's very powerful. Um, so, um, what do you think the key challenges are in getting the museum ready for the, oh, for the museum's UK accreditation scheme? Um, I mean, in the UK, accreditation is something that um, is open to um, all museums, and I understand at the moment that's not the case for South Georgia, but it is a sort of, it's a standard, it's in a gold standard for museum operations. Yes, so being part of the museum accreditation scheme, it, it it strengthens that network between museums and being part of that network is really, really helpful to a museum and it strengthens their role um, as a museum. But also it opens up opportunities for funding, which is obviously critical. Um, mm -hmm. And it also, it strengthens the knowledge that we're doing our job well. It means mm -hmm. that we're, you know, we're, we're mm -hmm. doing what we're supposed to be doing and creating a legacy for the future. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of that work is behind the scenes. It's very mm. unsexy. It's <laughs> sitting at the desk, um, you know, plugging, plugging away at a database, writing policies and plans and making sure all the records are kept in order. And it's, it's interesting, but um, not exciting. And <laughs> that's really hard to get funding for. You know, there's no, there's no immediate results from doing that work. It's a result that you get in 30, 40, 50 years ahead. Mm. So one of 
I guess my challenges as curator is to balance that behind the scenes work with creating work and content to engage the visitors. Obviously the visitors coming to the museum is important mm. as much as behind the scenes. And it's that, it's that balance mm. um, of work, you know, as I go through, as I go through my day-to-day -day role. Um, mm. And that, that's, that's the challenge. Mm. Keep all yeah. the balls juggling. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And what ideas do you have around building the museum's digital profile to extend its outreach and impact? So oh, at the moment, obviously, we've got the COVID situation. So mm -hmm. lots of museums are shut anyway and having to think about all of these angles. Um, but, but one of the issues with the South Georgia Museum is that it's a remote museum mm -hmm. and not everybody can get there. So it's trying to think how we can um, embrace digital um, social media to, to, to spread the word and to engage people in the museum. And just last week, we launched um, an Instagram account, and that's going really, really well. And I think Instagram works really well because you can create um, little sound bites, little stories with images just for people to dip in and out of. And I think that's worked really well in this world. You know, people can just collect facts and images. Um, and for the people who want to engage a bit deeper and want more information, they can then go to the website. So it's trying to um, make that connection between Facebook and Instagram and a deeper story on, on the web pages and try and build the website so people can go deeper if, if they want to. So that, that's the plan um, and that's, you know, at the moment because of the COVID situation, we've got time to work on that and, and that's what people seem to want. Um, so it's quite exciting. So yeah, we've, and we've, we've got... Challenge. <laughs> We've got the, you, you've, you've instigated the new um, object of the month as well, haven't you? Yeah, so the, the collection is not a huge collection, but it's got some really, really fascinating things. And, and one of the most frustrating things, I think, is not being able to see what's in the cupboard of a museum. But the <laughs> idea is to try and bring some of those things that are in cupboards of the museum to, to Instagram and to the website, just so people get to see a bit more. I mean, can you talk a little bit about some of the new exhibitions you might be thinking about? I mean, I realise this is a sort of short sort of season, isn't it, when visitors come, but you must be having thoughts about what you could do to take uh, the, the marriage between, if you like, the, the objects you were talking about earlier, but also the display aspects and that kind of communication um, objective. Yeah, so one, one of the um, areas that I'm interested in is it, obviously visitors get to go to South Georgia but their visits are quite short mm. and so it's almost like they're having a, a, an Instagram you know they run around the museum you know picking things that are catch their eyes and they don't get that full experience of the museum because they don't mm. have time and also because of Covid people are looking more towards digital engagement and I think we can offer not just the visitors to the museum, but people who can't get to the museum, mm -hmm. the same thing. And I think that's um, through the website. And so we, we're planning exhibitions for next October, so the next season for the actual museum. Mm. And that, but what we want to try and do is then connect them to the website so there's a bigger story. Mm. So we've got three big things happening. Um, on site, there is, um, on the heritage site, there is um, a heritage building called the Main Store. Um, it's like a giant hardware store that all the whalers kept all their nuts and bolts and hammers <laughs> and you know, it is like hardware store. And that's all intact and it's really fantastic. And the plan is to open up to the public. So um, hopefully next season, if all goes ahead, who knows, um, the idea is that that store will be open to the public and they can walk through. And so we're trying to put together some displays, set dress it, put some interpretation up to engage visitors with that store and how the store connects to the whaling story. Mm -hmm. In the museum, um, I also want to talk more about whales and, you know, the whale and what whales are, populations are like around South Georgia and what current research is happening around South Georgia. Um, and that's, you know, a lot of that comes, a lot of that data and research is coming from the South Georgia Heritage Trust and how we can tell that story. So that's another small display we want to do, but I think we can bring 
that onto the website and connect South Georgia Heritage Trust to that as well, to the museum. And then finally, it's the, the big one is um, next year is a centenary of the um, Quest uh, Rolet expedition. And that's a Shackleton's last expedition to Antarctica. And unfortunately, his untimely death um, in January 1921. Uh, so it's 100 years. And so we're going to, um, I was going to say celebrate, but that's probably the wrong word. Um, acknowledge those 100 years have passed and tell, retell that story. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be a physical exhibition in the museum. Um, really, really popular. And we're hoping you know, to, to give the, um, the visitors um, that story and give them some information about the funeral and the connection to Gritvik and, and to the whaling station. So that's huge. And again, we want to extend that story from the museum to, to the website. And so we can connect to people who can't make it to South Georgia. That's very exciting. <laughs> Are there any plans to extend the work that was done to record the oral histories of the whalers? So yes, this is another exciting idea we have. I get lots of um, emails and messages from um, families of ex-whalers and they want to see pictures or find out more about their life in South Georgia and so I think what would be really nice is if we can create um, a, a place on the website where people can connect to those stories so images documents you know video footage and what would be really wonderful is if we can connect as well by getting people to engage with the website so they bring their stories to the website and so so the idea is that it can grow into almost like a forum but so people can take images, but add images too. And then that would also include, I hope, some oral histories and take that story a bit bigger and a bit wider. And the other thing that would be really lovely is if we could maybe connect to some other museums in the UK. For example, a lot of the whalers on South Georgia were from Scotland. And so I know that in Scotland, there are museums such as the Shetland Museum that has a really lovely archive and connection to ex-whalers on Shetland and then all of those stories can and networks can come together um, and I think that'd be a really nice way of connecting people that are, can't actually come to South Georgia it's, it'll be digital. And, and sort of uh, you're talking about funding earlier and I just wondered sort of what part you felt that the museum could play in, in um, SGHT's charitable work in the in the coming year years maybe. So I think Museums have a very, I think, important role in society that you, they, they're very important to capture knowledge and that's what they're there for is to capture knowledge, capture objects, capture stories and preserve that knowledge and those objects and those stories and then pass that knowledge and history on to, you know, present and future generations mm -hmm. and that, that's, I guess, the fundamental part of our work with the museum. And I, I, I think with um, the connection to South Georgia Heritage Trust is that they're doing a similar role. They're trying to preserve the heritage of the island. They're trying to preserve the wildlife and that's how they're connected. And I think the museum is a really brilliant platform to be able to talk about that message and get mm -hmm. that message across and inspire and educate and mm -hmm. also to try and um, engage people to you know, take responsibility and take action. And, and that's what South Georgia Heritage Trust is doing. And, and I think they, you know, they work really well together. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jane, for that. And it's great to see that your work and the work of the museum is continuing despite everything. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> From, from my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. Bye for now. Bye.